All right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are, lesson 63, Ezekiel 22 and 23. You know, if you were to summarize uh, Ezekiel, you'd probably start feeling like it's a guy who gets a word from the Lord and all he does is dump bad news on his people. And the bad news on his people, I think if you were to take it one step further, they, they bring it on themselves. <laughs> and yet, as they hear this word, it's like, what did you say? <laughs> I get, what? And then they go on and do it anyway. They go on and do it, everything they want. It's like they don't really care. They're consulting the Lord. That's what we talked about in Ezekiel 20 yesterday. They're, they're playing the part they want to hear from the Lord, but they really only want to do what they want to do. Now, the problem is, is that there's going to be this judgment that falls on these leaders. So in Ex uh, Ezekiel 22, ooh, that was close. Ezekiel 22, let's just start in verse one. Uh, really, you're going to unfold. Uh, the word of the Lord came again to Ezekiel. Okay, so here's it is. Keep going, Kevin, if you can. Verse 2, Thou son of man, you'll pass judgment. Will you pass judgment? Will you pass judgment against the city of blood? Then explain all of her abominations to her. And it continues on. You're to say, to, you're to say this. This is what the Lord God says. A city that sheds blood within her walls, so that her time of judgment has come out, and who makes idols for herself, so that she is defiled. You're guilty of the blood you have shed, and you're defiled from the idols you have made. You have brought your judgment days near, and have come to your years of punishment. So in other words, Kevin, it's, it's right in front of their face. Judgment is right here. Therefore, I have made you a disgrace to the nations and a mockery to all the lands, which God was trying to protect. He didn't want to be a disgrace to all the nations. And then it says in verse five, then we'll get to the people that judgment's coming. Those who are near and those far away from you will mock you, you infamous one full of turmoil. So now here you're gonna see in verse six, Look, every prince of Israel within you has used his strength to shed blood. So now all of a sudden you have in Ezekiel 22, okay, you're going to begin to see these leaders, okay, uh, were falling into what we would consider gross sins. Okay, so in verse 6 and in verse 27, you're going to have this language of princess, P-R-I-N-C-E-S, her officials within her, are like wolves tearing their prey, shedding blood and destroying lives in order to make profit dishonestly. So here you have these princes and officials. And Kevin, they'll go at any, any cost to bring about profit, even if it means shedding blood of their own people, destroying lives in their own people. And so like these leaders have fallen into these gross sins and even what J. Vernon McGee says, apostasy. So in 6 and 27, you see these princes. Now we know princess, remember, is kings. Now remember, Ezekiel refuses to call Zedekiah a king. <laughs> he calls him constantly a prince. So this would be in a, uh, a reference to this. If you go to verse 25, uh, Ezekiel 22, verse 25, here is another illustration. The conspiracy of her prophets within her is like a roaring lion tearing its prey. They devour people, they seize wealth and valuables, and multiply the widows within her. So here you have prophets that are falling into, and there's this language of like, they're tearing people, they're tearing the prey. And, and why? Because they'll do whatever it takes. It says her prophets plaster them in verse 28 with whitewash for them by, that, by seeing false visions and lying divinations. And they say, this is what the Lord says, what the Lord has not spoken. So here it is. You have leaders, okay? You have princess and you have prophets. And then you go to verse 26, Kevin. Okay, just when you think it shouldn't come from these people, her priests do violence to my instruction and profane my holy things. They make no distinction between the holy and the common. That's actually a problem. And they do not explain the difference between the clean and unclean. Why? Because you can't tell the difference about them. <laughs> they disregard my Sabbaths and I am profaned among them. So now here we have princess, we have prophets, and we have priests. You cannot go through Ezekiel without covering verse 30. Verse 30 is, I don't want to say like one of the main verses, but man, it sure seems like it. Ezekiel 22, 30 says, I searched for a man among them who would repair the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land so that I might not destroy it. But I found no one. So imagine this, God with this, visual with these supernatural eyes, right? You know, like the supernatural vision. He can see through anything. He understands everything in the darkness, everything in the light. And it says he looked everywhere and he couldn't find one person. Kevin, one person amongst two. 
All his chosen people. All of his own chosen people. I'm looking for one man who would repair the wall, who would be willing to go back and to fix things and stand in the gap. What does that mean, stand in the gap, you think? Uh, intercede. Stand in the gap, intercede on behalf of the land. So now, think about this. There's this image of the wall and the gap, and then here's the land. So like, is there anybody going to come in and fix this and stand on behalf of this so that I'm not going to destroy it? And God says, uh, n no. Now, when I heard this, I was a little offended at first, honestly, because I'm like, what about Ezekiel? You know, Ezekiel doesn't count. <laughs> I also want to describe this. Ezekiel doesn't count. Jeremiah, they were both faithful. But apart from them, God saw a man outside of these. That's the only way I could think about this. John MacArthur says God saw somebody outside of these men and he couldn't find anybody. So ultimately, what are we waiting for? Ultimately, we're waiting for the new David. This is what we've been talking about over and over again. The new heart, the new spirit, the person that's going to come in, the good shepherd that's going to come in and gather everybody together, right? Because that's that person, that person who stands in the gap, the person who's going to re repair the wall, like to bring everybody back into the fold, to protect the land. It's the new David that's going to happen. Kevin, if you would, would you go to Isaiah 59, verse 16, please? Isaiah 59, verse 16. So it's not with the princess. It's not with the officials. It's not with the prophets. It's not with the priests. In fact, there's nobody on the land. <clears throat> in Isaiah 59, 16, Isaiah says very similar. He says, I saw that there was no man. He was amazed that there was no one interceding. So his own arm brought salvation and his own righteous supported him. So what does he find? He finds that there's nobody there. And to your point again about the standing in the gap, there's nobody interceding. So what does he do? He decides that his own arm is going to bring salvation. And so the only answer can be himself. In fact, if you go to verse 17, really, it goes on. Verse 17, he put on righteousness like a breastplate, a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing. He wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. And in verse 18 and 19, thus he will repay according to their deeds, fury to the enemies, retribution to his foes, and he will repay the coastlands. Verse 19, they will fear the name of Yahweh in the west, his glory in the east, for he will come like a rushing stream driven by the wind of the Lord. Yes, the only answer is Yahweh. The only answer is it's going to come through the new David. In fact, if you go to Isaiah 63, verse 5, same imagery here. Only God's Messiah is going to answer this question. It's Isaiah 63, 5, I looked, but there was no one to help. And I was amazed that no one assisted. So my arm accomplished victory for me and my wrath assisted me. I love that. I looked, hey, anybody here? Anybody want to help? Oh yeah, I can do it, he says. Victory comes through him. I said, uh, uh, I think for me, the reason I wanted to point this out before we go to Ezekiel 23 is that it's not in the government officials. It's not in the well-known speakers and the prophets. It's not in the priests or the pastors or the teachers. Your stock is never in that leadership. Your stock is only in him. When are they going to figure this thing out? I don't know, guys. You got any other thoughts on this? No, they're just looking in all the wrong places. Here, here's the craziest thing, though. They are looking in all the wrong places. You know, Zechariah 12.10. We've alluded to this over and over again. I hope we get to Ezekiel 23, but we might not. Go to Zechariah 12.10. Okay, now we've read this over and over again. But you got to understand something. The scripture says, now, why when, then when I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer in the house of David and the residents of Jerusalem, it says, and they will look at me whom they pierced, which implies his own people rejected him. So even when he came the first time, Kevin, the son of man was rejected. And so let me just say this. We, we've talked about these different, right? These different uh, time frames, we'll just draw it a little bit different. So it's not on his first coming. It's only on well, the return. When the new David comes and collects his sheep and brings them into the fold. They'll mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly for as one weeps for a firstborn. So they're going to keep looking and looking and looking and looking and looking until right before at the end of the tribulation. Okay, here we go. End times at the seven years, right at the end, somewhere in all of this, they're going to cry out and say, man, I can't believe we missed it. I can't believe we missed this. Well, all right, let's go. Let's go on to Ezekiel if we can. 
23. Ezekiel 23 is interesting. Uh, what you're going to see is, is it's going to be a description of uh, the northern kingdoms, which is Israel, and the southern kingdoms, which is Judah. And I know Jerusalem is not a part of a tribe, but it's part of what we would usually consider into the southern language, okay? So what you're going to see is that the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom both play what we would call the harlot. Both of them play this game of spiritual uh, adultery, spiritual prostitution with the world, with other nations, with, the, with other uh, idols. And so that's what you're going to see in Ezekiel 23, is that the northern and the southern are, are really, quote-unquote, playing games. What's interesting is in Ezekiel 16 and Ezekiel 23, they both have this language. If you guys remember Ezekiel 16, do you remember this? It was very, very graphic. Uh, it's very graphic. So when we had Max Ray here, remember this? He was sitting here and we went through the history of Israel. But the whole thing was describing Israel as a prostitute. So Ezekiel 16 has that language of a prostitute. I don't know how to say this, you guys. They're selling themselves out. Uh, to get things of the world. And that's what you see in Ezekiel 16, Kevin. But they're not selling, they're actually paying. <laughs> Tom Constable, you're absolutely right. Tom Constable says in Ezekiel 16, okay, uh, what you see is, is that Canaan, okay, this is important to understand, Ezekiel 16 portrays Canaan as the mother of Israel. Remember that? Remember the Amorites and the Hittites? Remember they came from this? So Canaan is the mother of Israel who corrupted her daughter, now listen to this, by teaching her spiritual adultery. Okay, so they taught her spiritual adultery. Okay, that was the mentality in Ezekiel 16. On Ezekiel 23, Israel herself, okay, is responsible for pursuing the political adultery. So here you have in Ezekiel 16, they were taught this. In Ezekiel 23, you hear them picking on the responsibility themselves politically. Political adultery means they're exposing themselves to other countries when they should have stayed focused on the Lord, if that makes sense. And then here, I would say this, in Ezekiel 16, you see the beginnings, because remember, it's the history, the beginnings of Israel's unfaithful uh, career. I mean, that's really, that's, it, that's all it is. It's their unfaithful career. But in Ezekiel 23, you see the all of uh, Israel's unfaithful career. <laughs> and then finally, Ezekiel 16 deals strictly with just Judah. And today, in Ezekiel 23, you're going to get uh, both Israel and Judah with a focus on Judah. 16 doesn't cover Israel, but 23 covers both with a focus on Judah. So again, it goes back to what we said, Kevin, even two days ago. Ezekiel feels repetitive. And that's what you're going to get again today. You're going to get Ezekiel 23. It's going to feel repetitious of Ezekiel 16 with, I don't know how to describe this, but with a lot more graphic details. A lot. I read some of this to Laura and she's like, whoa, whoa, it, whoa, it says that? Yeah, so uh, again, I'll use a classic Gordy line. I didn't uh, write this, I just read it. Ezekiel 23, verse 1 says, The word of the Lord came to me again. Kevin, who's me? Ezekiel. Ezekiel. So you have this vision that he sees something, maybe in a dream. Somehow he's receiving, at this point, he's receiving a word from the Lord. And by the way, he's supposed to articulate this to, yes, the exiles, possibly the elders as well. Uh, and it says this, for sure the elders at some point. And here's the word of the Lord came to me. He says, son of man, there were two women. Okay? The two women are, just so you know, there's this parable. Okay? The two women are Israel and Judah. Okay? That would be the northern and the southern kingdom. Okay? And that they are divided. But it's interesting, they're daughters of the same mother, which would mean they at one point we're back here. You remember when Solomon was a unified kingdom? So this is the image. The same mother is a unified kingdom. The two women are the divided kingdom. Okay, this is the image that you have. And what you're going to begin to see is something very graphic. Verse 3, it says this. So these two women, okay, right now we don't know who they are. We just, there's a reference. They acted like prostitutes in Egypt. Okay, right away, Kevin, in Egypt, why? Because that's where they were, right? For a long, long time. They acted like prostitutes in Egypt, behaving promiscuously in their youth. So in their young age, which this doesn't give any, uh, please don't hear this in any justification, but earlier on, they're maybe still trying to figure things out. 
like in their youth. I'm not justifying it all, but that's, there's this youth in their early age. They're still growing. They're trying to figure this thing out. It says their breasts were fondled there and their virgin nipples caressed. I mean, like it's very graphic, but they were giving up of themselves to who? To the Egyptians. They were clearly turning themselves over to the Egyptian men. And what else can you say? But Tom Constable says they became intimate with them. So here you have the northern, the southern kingdoms exposing themselves and actually walking things out with Egyptian Egyptian men. Now, here's who the two women are. It says this, the older one. So, man, these are crazy names, by the way. Okay, so one of the women, this is the older woman, Ahola. <laughs> and her sister was Aholaba. <laughs> All right, so you have Ahola is the older one, okay? Now, it says, and her sister was Aholaba. They became mine and gave birth to sons and daughters. As for their names, Ahola represents Samaria. Let's go to the map. I know it's just a, we have a, a purple region map, but all right. So here's what you're going to have in this area. OK, I feel like a weather guy right over here. All right. So here you have uh, and it says their names Ahola represents Samaria and Aholaba represents Jerusalem. OK, so northern and southern. OK, so you have Samaria, which is going to represent northern and Aholaba is southern, which is going to represent Jerusalem and the southern kingdom. Now it says this, if you'll continue on in verse five, Ahola acted like a prostitute, even though she was mine. So it was my child, right? This is quote what he's saying, but yet she didn't act like it. She lusted after her lovers, the Assyrians, warriors. Now, Kevin, uh, let's get into this description a little bit, but, but you're going to see in verses five through 10, okay, in five through 10, you see the, Samarit the Samaria's prostitution. And clearly, Kevin, the prostitution is with who? What does it say? Assyrians. The Assyrians, which is absolutely crazy because, Kevin, you know this all too well. What happened? The Assyrians took them captive. Can you go back to the other one? So in the northern kingdom, what you see is the northern kingdom up here, the Assyrian captivity, they took these guys. And this is the language. Why did they take them? Because it says, it says she lusted after her lovers. So in the northern kingdom, they lusted after those that were coming after them. The warriors, now look at this, dressed in blue, governors and prefects, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding on. Scripture says, and then it says that uh, Ahola offered her sexual favors to them. All of them were the elite of Syria. She defiled herself with all those she lusted after and with all their idols. Like, can you get any more graphic? Verse eight, she didn't give up her promiscuity that began in Egypt when men slept with her in her youth, caressed her virgin nipples and poured out their lust on her. Like she is, it's nonstop. Therefore, verse nine, I handed her over to her lovers, the Assyrians she lusted for. So what she gave into in temptation destroyed her. Temptation, you guys, is not sin, but when you give in to temptation, it can bring death. And that, that's what you see. That's what you see in scriptures. Even the New Testament talks about this. And then what happens in verse 10? Well, the Assyrians, they exposed her nakedness. They seized her sons and daughters. They killed her with the sword. And since they executed judgment against her, she became notorious among women. And so what do you have? It says in verse 9 to go back. I handed her over to her lovers in 722 B.C. You see them fall. Ezekiel is talking to all of the exiles. Okay, somehow the message goes out, whether he's in his house and it goes out, whether he's at the elders and they go out. But either way, he's painting a picture, you guys. This really isn't them. He's painting a picture about what's happened in the past and how they gave in. Ahola, the older one, gave in to, yes, the Samaritans uh, gave in to prostitution and exposing themselves to the enemy. Enemy. Here's what I wanted to say. Satan is, is here to steal, kill, and destroy. Everybody always thinks if I just give in a little bit, it's fine. Nobody's going to catch. It's never going to catch up. It always catches up. It killed the northern kingdom, you guys. But if you just hang out there, he's not done because in verses 11 through 21, don't worry. Now you see Jerusalem's prostitution. Two women, Ahola and now we're in Aholaba. Okay, Aholaba, which means my tabernacle is in her. My temple is there. And he says, now her sister Aholaba saw what happened, right, to Hola. They saw what happened to the Assyrian captivity. But she was even more depraved in her lust than Ahola. 
and made her promiscuous acts worse than those of her sister. So the Assyrians come in and wipe out, Kevin, almost all of the 10 northern tribes. Obviously, there's the scattered remnant, but they didn't even care. And in verse 12, the scripture continues on, and she lusted after the Assyrians. Same language. Governors and prefects, warriors, splendidly dressed, horsemen riding on steeds, all of them desirable young men. And I saw that she had defiled herself. Both of them had taken the same path. So, well, hey, shoot. If they went after the Assyrians, why shouldn't we? Verse 14 is an unbelievable image of pornography. I want you to look at this. But she increased her promiscuity. Okay, so Aholabah increased in her sin when she saw male figures carved on the wall. Images of the Chaldeans engraved in vermilion, like in their actual graphic images, literally of seeing things on the wall, guess what it did? It caused them to give into more sin because they practically saw these things. People of Judah actually sinned more than Samaria and they gave in, they lusted after even the Babylonians. I mean, look what it says, the images of the Chaldeans. In verse 14, they looked at these images and Judah was drawn to the portraits. And then that led to, yes, uh, spiritual adultery. What did they see? Wearing belts, it says in verse 15, on their waists and flowing turbans on their heads. All of them looked like officers, a depiction of the Babylonians in Chaldea, the land of the birth. They thought what they saw was better than what they really had. So at the sight of them, she lusted after them and sent messengers to them in Chaldea. Look, I, look, this is, this is killing the church, you guys. This is killing the church. This is killing America. The pornography industry, just on images alone, have caused people to go do things just by looking at something that they should have never been putting their eyes to in front of uh, uh, ever before. The Assyrians obviously won over the, the northern tribes, but the but the folks from Aholaba never learned. In fact, they wanted more of it. It says, at the sight of them, she lusted after them, and then they went for it. Verse 17, it says this, Then the Babylonians came to her, to the bed of love, and defiled her with their lust. But after she was defiled by them, she turned away from them in disgust. I mean, isn't that the truth? When you do sin, you feel disgusting. You feel gross. What did I do? That's exactly what happened. They gave into the Babylonian army. They welcomed them with love and open arms. And in verse 18, when she flaunted her promiscuity and exposed her nakedness, I turned away from her in disgust, just as I turned away from her sister. The nakedness exposed everything. And in verse 19, it says, yet she multiplied her acts of promiscuity, remembering the days of her youth when she acted like a prostitute in the land of Egypt. Verse 20, and lusted after their lovers whose sexual members were like those of donkeys and whose emission was like of stallions. Like, I, man, I, I don't know how to do this without being graphic. Like, like they pursued Babylon like donkeys and stallions, donkeys and horses in heat. That's exactly what it says. They had such a strong sexual desire now, when I say sexual desire, I'm talking about spiritual prostitution to give up of their walk with the Lord, to turn away from the Lord. Remember, Aholabah, uh, you know, my tabernacle is in her, my temple is here. I'm, I'm turning away from the temple. I'm turning away from the Lord and I'm, I'm passionately pursuing false idols. I'm passionately pursuing the Babylonian army. I think there's more stock and security in them than in the Lord. And the scripture says donkeys and horses and stallions, they're going hardcore after them. Why he has to be so graphic, but he does. And then he keeps on going. He doesn't stop with his image. In verse 21, so you revisited the indecent, indecency of your youth when the Egyptians caressed your nipples to enjoy your bre youthful breasts. It's like, okay, we, we got it. We get the image, okay? Like this is, you keep saying this over and over and over again. And then in verse 22, here it is. Now you're going to see judgment because of your prostitution. So now we're going to just hang out on, on, on the Jerusalem side, not under the Northern Kingdom side. Therefore, Aholabah, Okay, this is what the Lord God says. I'm going to incite your lovers against you. Those who turned away from them in disgust, I'll bring them against you from every side. In other words, I'm going to stir up your lovers is what I'm going to do. The Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, the Pekod, Shoad and Coed and all of the Assyrians. I'm going to bring everybody, desirable young men and all the governors and prefects, officers and administrators, all of them riding 
on horses. I think it's interesting that he even had to say that. The whole world is going to what, Kevin? They're going to come against Israel. That's what you see here. They're going to come against you with an alliance of nations and with weapons, chariots, wagons. They'll set themselves against you on every side with shields, bucklers, helmets. I will delegate judgment to them and they will judge you by their own standards. When I vent my jealous rage on you, they'll deal with you in wrath. Everybody's coming. They'll cut off your nose and your ears and your descendants will fall by the sword. They'll seize your sons and daughters and your descendants will be consumed by fire. Like this is what's going to happen. The Babylonians are going to come and they're going to bring about this dis, dismemberment. Uh, <laughs> Literally, it's a punishment for an adulterous person. Literally, we're going to do this to your face. They'll strip off your clothes, take your beautiful jewelry. So I will put an end to your indecency, your sexual immorality. I'm sick of it. It began in Egypt and you'll no longer look longingly at them or remember Egypt anymore. Like, oh yeah, do you, do you remember the good old days? God says in verse 28, I'm going to hand you over to those who hate you, to those you turned away from in disgust. And so here you have this big picture of what's going to take place. Everybody's going to come. But now watch this. It says in verse 31, you followed the path of your sister, Aholaba. You followed Ahola. And look what it says. So I'll put her cup in your hand. This is what the Lord God says. You will drink your sister's cup, which is deep and wide. You will be an object of ridicule and scorn for it holds so much. In other words, anytime you hear this language of cup that comes from the Lord, <laughs> it's usually the cup of wrath. Usually there's this picture of God's judgment. It handed it out in 722 B.C. And oh, by the way, judgment is coming for you as well. Jerusalem and Southern Kingdom. Because Kevin, at this point, they haven't received news that Jerusalem has been crushed. All we know is that the prophecy is coming. You, Jerusalem, will be destroyed. Verse 33, you'll be filled with drunkenness and grief with a cup of devastation and desolation. The cup of your sister Des uh, of Samaria. And oh, by the way, you're going to drink it. You're going to drain it. You'll gnaw its broken pieces. You'll tear your breasts. For I have spoken. This is the declaration of the Lord God. And he says in verse 30, 35, it's, it's almost like a, just in case you missed it. Therefore, this is what the Lord God says, because you've forgotten me and cast me behind your back. You must bear the consequences of your indecency and promiscuity. You never thought that those sexual sins of turning over to these false idols was ever going to catch up with you. It has. It will wipe out the city of Jerusalem. 722, it happened with the Assyrians and the northern kingdom. They got taken into captivity. And now he, what you see and what you hear, you guys, is a prophetic word that says, by the way, destruction is coming in 586 to your city, Jerusalem. And all you see, you guys, really in verses 36 and on, 36 through 49, is this massive judgment, massive summary ju judgment of, of Israel's unfaithfulness. How unfaithful you have become. Why? Because you've forgotten me. And that image is sad, but it's so true because you, you cast me behind your back. Because you cast me behind your back, you now will deal with the consequences of all that you've exposed yourself to. It will catch up and it's going to catch up with the southern kingdom. All right, guys, this is uh, Ezekiel 22 and 23. And we'll continue on the study tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs>